I think we can start. Uh, welcome, dear Chair uh, McAllister, honored members of the European Parliament, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues present in the room and online. On behalf of the European Parliament Research Service, let me welcome you to this event today. Uncertainty and contestation define today's world, but most probably also the world of tomorrow. It's up to us Europeans to address such challenges united. It's up to us to anticipate risks to our security and tackle threats whenever they arise. Leadership is key in anticipating risks as well as in preparing for and responding to crisis. Hence, today's roundtable is about leadership in EU's foreign and security policy. And we start with a question which sounds simple, but maybe is not that simple. Who speaks for Europe? To debate this question, we have an outstanding panel of practitioners and think tankers. They will focus on the relationship between the different actors with a role in EU's external representation, considering both legal aspects and day-to-day -day practices. My colleague Astrid, Astrid Worm, the head of the EPS European Council Oversight Unit, will moderate the debate, which will be followed by a Q&A session with the on-site and online participants. Before I hand over to Mr. David McAllister, Chair of the European Parliament Committee on Foreign Affairs, to deliver the opening remarks. I would like to draw your attention also to several of our EPS publications on display at the entry of the room or circulated in electronic version with the invitation to this event. I'm grateful to colleagues for their efforts in putting together these publications. And let me highlight one particular briefing on the European Council President and the US, EU's external representation interaction in times of war in Europe, which is the main rationale for our policy roundtable today. With that, I now give the floor to the Chair, Mr. David McAllister, to make his opening remarks. Let me wish you all a fruitful discussion. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Mr. Hiller, for giving me the floor, and it's a pleasure to say a few words on behalf of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the European Parliament on the occasion of this event, which certainly promises to be a highly interesting and timely discussion. Now, I guess all of us in the last few hours have been reading obituaries about the great Henry Kissinger, who just passed away. And of course, in all these overtrueries, we come across a sentence, whether he said it or not, but at least it has been attributed to him, who do I call if I want to speak to Europe? And this is exactly today's question. Indeed, who speaks for Europe? This question has been debated for decades, but perhaps a bit more frequently in these past few years and even months. Four prominent candidates who may be speaking for Europe are presented there. I could name a few more. The changes in the geopolitical context of the recent years, the COVID-19 pandemic and the Russian war of aggression against Ukraine have significantly increased demands towards the EU to mobilize partner countries and to build regional and global alliances around EU strategic priorities. At the same time, these developments have highlighted the poor understanding of the EU's perspective in partner countries around the world, as well as the limits of our political influence. The strength of our European Union is our unity. The internal market and the common policies have 
and are and have always been our stronghold. When it comes to foreign policy, and here I circle back to Mr. Kissinger's supposed remark, we have struggled to portray unity at all times. Let's have a quick look back. 30 years ago, in 1993, the member states committed themselves to a common foreign and security policy. And it was then the Lisbon Treaty that entered into force in 2009, which actually provided the European Union with a new institutional structure for its external service, and major efforts have been made to implement the new institutional setup ever since. The European Union acquired legal personality, the post of Vice President of the Commission High Representative of Foreign Affairs and Security Policy has been created. He or she ensures the overall political coordination and the unity, consistency and effectiveness of the Union's external action. The European External Action Service has been operationalized and our EU delegations around the world have boosted our presence and increased diplomatic and policy outreach. Within the last year, specifically, Parliament's role in the EU external action has also grown, gradually evolving from a somewhat marginal to a substantial one, combining our legislative, our budgetary and our scrutiny powers with multiple forms of engagement with countries from outside the European Union. Given our wide network of contacts, we have a distinct role to play in complementing the visibility and the impact of the EU's foreign and security policy alongside the European External Action Service, the Commission, and of course also the diplomatic services of our member states. A good example which I like to refer to is an institution in this parliament, the Democracy Support and Election Observation Group, or DEG, which I have the honour to chair together with my colleague Thomas Dubé, who chairs the DEVE committee. This is a group of 15 MPs, MEPs, and we have put forward a number of impactful ideas in recent years, one top of being responsible for all our parliamentary activities related to elections observation. The Democracy Support and Election Coordination Group also accounts for activities promoting democracy in areas like supporting the parliamentary democracy in partner countries, activities and connections with the Sakharov Prize Network and human rights related actions, or also parliamentary mediation, facilitation and dialogue activities. But despite the active contribution in external affairs, I do believe there remains great untapped potential for the European Parliament. Parliament can and should further its diplomatic role by virtue of our distinct instruments, channels and contacts. We can engage key political stakeholders and in doing so playing a complementing role to that of the EU delegations. What I like to underline so often when I speak as Chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee is we are all Team Europe. We are all Team Europe. The Commission, the AAS, and also the European Parliament. A number of provisions of the Lisbon Treaty, designed to provide a boost to foreign security and defence policies, unfortunately are still not implemented. The Member States currently knack the necessary consensus to transfer any further competences to Brussels. The nation state will remain the source of legitimacy in foreign and security policy for a foreseeable future. But given the wide range of voices and actors who speak for Europe on the international stage, we need to improve our ability of constructing a united EU27 narrative. This year's Parliament's report on the CFSP to be adopted in the January plenary will once again call on member states need to enable the EU to speak with one voice, increasing credibility and preserving coherence. This has never been easy, though in recent times it has become even more difficult. In order to avoid inconsistent, at times even contradictory or competing narratives we need to genuinely operationalize 
Team Europe. Launched by the European Commission in April 2020, the original aim of Team Europe was to support the EU partner countries in overcoming the coronavirus crisis. Over the course of three years, the last three years, however, the term has evolved into an overarching approach to a joint and coordinated European foreign and development policy. When we join forces, our 27 member states and the EU institutions, together let me also name the European Investment Bank and the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, our joint external action becomes more than the sum of its parts. By working together and pooling our resources and expertise, we can deliver more effectiveness and greater impact. Crucial to this idea is also the establishment of a European Diplomatic Academy, which the EAS launched with a two-phase pilot project in 2022. And I'm happy that my dear friend and colleague, Nacho sanchez Amor, who has been very helpful behind the scenes here, has just entered the room. The aim is to build a European diplomatic core that shares a truly common European diplomatic culture, thereby capable of promoting and defending the EU's interests in the world. Around 40 junior diplomats from member states and officials from the EU institutions took part in the first nine-month phase in 2022 and 2023. The second phase in 2023 and 2024 will run over two separate editions with around 25 junior diplomats and officials attending each for a total of 50 participants. I just received these young people in Strasbourg. That was delightful, and I think Europe has a good future. I met them in Strasbourg, and I firmly believe that this initiative is a positive example of how the European Union can keep moving forward towards its own diplomatic service, which is underpinned by a common diplomatic culture. Ladies and gentlemen, there are so many aspects to the question of who speaks for Europe, but I will stop here now. I'm looking forward to a rich discussion. I would like to thank the European Parliamentary Research Service for organizing this. It's always a pleasure to be here in this great library, and I myself will now listen carefully how we find an answer, who actually speaks for Europe. And if there's one thing we might change in the next reform of our institutions or whatever, I think we have a few titles too much which are called president. <laughs> Sometimes I have the impression everyone in this city has to be a president. But perhaps we can start with different functions and different titles so people understand better. And finally, if you do a field survey in one of the member states, in my home country, Germany, or in any other one, if you find citizens who can exactly explain the difference, between the European Council, the Council of Europe, and other institutions, I'll invite you for free beers. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. McAllister, for your inspiring introduction. You raised some critical questions for today's debate. Uh, and thank you for staying with us for the rest of the discussion. My name is Astrid Worham. I will be moderating the debate from, uh, from now on. The topic of our discussion who speaks for Europe, as you said, Mr. McAllister, is very close to the question that was raised by Mr. Kissinger, but that was a certain time ago. He actually admitted that he did not say it, but he was very happy to take credit for it because he then said, it is actually a good statement. Yeah, it is a good statement because, uh, well, we, he, we talked about it 20 years ago and we're still asking the question today in 2023. Although, in the meantime, we've had the Lisbon Treaty, the main priority, or one priority of which, was actually to ensure the visibility and effectiveness of the European external action. Nevertheless, we're still today to ask this question. In 2009, when the uh, treaty entered into force, Mr. Barroso, the then president of the Commission, said, from today on, um, the, the question of Mr. Kissinger has been solved. We have a visible external action service. We have a visible external action. I don't know if he was right. Apparently not, because if you are um, a new official from a third country or simply a European citizen, 
The EU institutional setup is not always crystal clear, as you mentioned earlier. Whilst in the US we have one president, in the EU we have many of them. We have a president of the European Council, a president of the European Commission, and there is no clear-cut division of work between them in the field of external representation. In addition, we've got a high representative for foreign affairs and security policy. We've got a president of the parliament who is actively conducting uh, diplom well, uh, parliamentary diplomacy. But not to forget, we have the presidents and prime ministers of 27 member states who are always eager to express themselves. Now, if you look at this picture, structurally, there is bound to be some competition. And in practice, it is extremely difficult, not to put it that way, to avoid any rhetoric nuances between all the actors. So in this framework, how can the EU actually speak with one voice? How can it convey a credible and united message towards uh, on the global stage? And that's what we're here to discuss today, because in, in our challenging security environment, it is a critical question. So our roundtable could not be timelier, and we've got an outstanding panel to discuss this question. I, I will take the speakers in order as, um, as they appear on the program. So we have Mr. Jim Claus, who was um, Director General for General and Institutional Policy in the Council Secretariat until his retirement in 2022. On my left, directly, Camilo Villarino, who is Head of Cabinet of the High Representative for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy. On, the, on my far right, Tirona Lavrelashvili, who is policy analyst at the European Policy Center. Right next to me, Desmond Dynan, who teaches European politics at George Mason University. And on the far left, Susanna Angle, who used to be part of the European Council Oversight Unit, but is now policy analyst in the Policy Foresight Unit. Uh, the biographies of the speakers have been uh, distributed, so you can uh, look look into them if you want to have further information. Um, we've talk, uh, talked about the question and answer session. The only thing I want to point out is that uh, with, agree with the agreement of the speakers, I suggested to change the order of the inter intervention with Professor Dynan speaking just ahead of uh, Tiona Lavrelashvili. Now let's move on to our first speaker. Mr. Mr. Claus, you have served three permanent uh, presidents of the European Council and at least a dozen rotating council presidencies before Lisbon. So you've got a very large and broad overview of the role of the EU's external, of the role of the president of the European Council in the external representation. And we're very eager to hear you, your contribution. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much, Astrid. Uh, first of all, I, I will talk a bit more than about the European Council because one of the basic principles in the EU is that not one institution can do anything without the other. So you have to put things into context. I'll start with three remarks. The first remark is precisely about that. The nature of the EU is such that the slogan of speaking with one voice to me doesn't make much sense. Uh, it's impossible. There will always be many voices in view of the various legitimacy we have in our system. What is important is not the one voice. What is important is that the voices which express themselves sing in harmony, in harmony and in unison. And they are trying to portray positions adopted by the EU according to its normal uh, way of taking decisions. My second remark is that representation does not mean owning a policy. You know, uh, the Commission plays a major role in trade policy and in the external representation of it, but it doesn't own it. The decisions are being taken by the Council and if it's legislative by the Council and the Parliament. Uh, uh, so uh, this idea that, you know, this is their property is of course completely wrong. That's not the way uh, it works. My third remark is of course linked to all of this and it is about cooperation between the various actors. We're not going to have one president of the EU. I'm, uh, I hope not, because I think it would be a very bad idea. Uh, I think it would rip the union apart, actually, rather than unite it. But anyway, in the present system, we have various presidents with various roles. What really is important is the cooperation uh, between them. And there, of course, the 
uh, kind of uh, uh, visits of some without consultation with the others or trying to position oneself across the, thoughts, the divisions which, are, which exist between some of the actors which we all know about, uh, is not very good for the EU image, uh, very frankly. Uh, it's, it's, I'll come back to that a bit later. Uh, let me quickly say a few words about the treaties, because they are important, and the practice. Uh, first, I'd start with the European Council, because you asked me to. The European Council is, of course, a major player in foreign policy. Incidentally, uh, for those who know how it was created in 1974, one of the reasons for its creation was precisely foreign policy, because after the failure of the defence community in 1954, Foreign and security policy was completely outside the competence of the EEC. So the only way to talk about those issues, and you had to talk about foreign policy, you could not avoid it. If you have a joint customs union, you have a common trade policy, you obviously need a foreign policy. The only way was by the heads of state and governments who as national leaders could of course talk about foreign policy to do that. And one of the great successes right early after this was in 1980. I mean, we talk a lot about Israel and Palestine, two-state solution. The ones who promoted this first were not the Americans, it was the Europeans in Venice in 1980. Unfortunately, it's not been implemented, but that's not only the fault of the EU. So the European Council has always fixed the general political direction of the EU. That's now formally in the treaty after Lisbon, but it has always been the case. This also applies to foreign policy, and for foreign policy, for CFSP specifically, the European Council fixes strategic guidelines. So obviously it plays a major role, which means its president plays a major role. The president of the European Council represents the Union at his level on CFSP matters, without prejudice, of course, to the role of the HR. Uh, so this is an important role. I would add to this that Historically speaking, the president of the European Council was always the leader of the EU delegation. Of course, our situation is particular because the president of the uh, Commission is also acting at the level of heads of state and government, so they have to find a modus vivendi. Uh, secondly, the HR, uh, uh, David McAllister talked about not ha having too many names and sigils. I think we should also talk about the people, the way they define in the treaty. It is HR, it's not HRVP. HRVP is a misnomer because when Borrell sits at front, chairs the Foreign Affairs Council, he is chair of the council and nothing else. When he sits in the commission, he's vice president. Now, he happens as a person to have three functions, but they are completely different. And if you mix them together, you make a mistake. The HR, of course, runs foreign policy in close uh, cooperation with the president of the European Council. Uh, the EAS is important, but it's a service, it's not a new institution. Then, of course, you have the Commission, and Lisbon didn't change one important factor. That is, apart from CFSP and ESDP, it's the Commission which represents the EU outside. That's very, very important to remember. And that is why also in summits, the Commission President obviously has a very important role and should have one. Lastly, I don't know, I think the President mentioned this, uh, uh, that the, of course, the member states, the 27, since CFSP is an intergovernmental policy, they are, of course, completely free to speak uh, about it. So they also represent the EU. Uh, our member states sitting in the various international organizations speak for the EU. Hopefully, they support it, as the treaty says, and they don't go uh, against it. Let me lastly uh, come to uh, two or three uh, ideas for the future. The first one, I come back to cooperation. I mean, if I had my way, I would lock the President of the Commission and the President of the European Council together with the HR into a room and say you won't get out before you've sorted out an, ad hoc, an intelligent way of uh, representing the Union abroad. Uh, now, uh, one of the ideas I would have is when there is an international meeting where clearly the majority of the element is political, I think they should agree that the PAC only goes together with the HR. If it's clearly mainly economic, I think the President of the Commission should go with the HR, this time, you know, also as Vice President, but also because he's the HR, so he can talk about political issues. Those are a few uh, very small ideas. The second idea is, I think uh, we should do uh, tasking of others, including other institutions in some cases, for instance, when Juncker went to talk and did a deal with Trump, this was done in full cooperation with Tusk. 
and the European Council. That's the way to do things. You can also task member states. We have experience with that, uh, sometimes better than in other cases. In the case of uh, uh, the, um, uh, the Normandy format, where France and Germany represented us, it would have been better if the AGI had been directly associated with this, which was the case in the Iran negotiations. So that is a different thing where uh, we should work together. A third point is uh, the uh, external representation of the euro. We have not drawn the conclusions in external representation of the existence of the euro. If you look at our representation in the IMF, it's a joke. We are scattered across constituencies, and that's why we're not so influenced, as influenced as we should be. My country, Luxembourg, with Belgium, is in a constituency which is chaired by Turkey, which has Kazakhstan and a few others. Why don't we have a Euro constituency in the IMF? Incidentally, we would be the biggest shareholder. We could even claim the seat of the IMF. Not that I propose this. We have enough seats in the European Union, so we need another one. But uh, we really should do this. And last point, uh, and then I'll stop. Uh, I know this is highly sensitive and it's not de main la veille like the French say, but if we really want to be a global actor one day, we should think about the representation of the EU in the United Nations Security Council. Because uh, the overcrowding in all the international fora, be it the G7, the G20 or uh, the Security Council, plays against Europe. We are quantitatively extremely well represented, but to the detriment of quality, which would there mean an EU Thing. Now, I know this is not going to happen soon, but I think it's very important. So all of this is uh, a bit sensitive. Uh, uh, I, I do believe, and uh, that's my final word, that in an area like that, where there are different possible interpretations of the exact roles, it's entirely normal, I really think that you should apply a maximum of mutual tolerance, working together, and trying to present the union in the best possible way abroad. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Klaus, for your uh, captivating contribution. Um, you, you insisted very much on cooperation, which has maybe sometimes been lacking indeed. And I, I note that you propose a sort of more modest vivendi between the European Council President and the European, Council, uh, the European uh, Commission President and the European Council President. Maybe it should be suggested to the heads of state to take a decision on that matter. Anyway, thank you. Let's move to, this, uh, to our second speaker, Mr. Villarino. You, uh, you are working for um, a high representative who's been extremely active. You have faced a series of major crises in the course uh, of his mandate. And of course, the high representative as head of the European um, External Action Service has a key role in what we are saying, the cooperation mentioned earlier and the consistency of, of EU external action. So we're looking forward to hearing uh, more on his activities from you. Thank you. Thank you, Astrid. Thank you to the European Parliament for organizing this event and giving me the opportunity of uh, intervening. Uh, I will speak as a current practitioner. Um, on the scene center, um, we have the institutional setup uh, which appears in the treaties, which has been described very well by, by Jim. Uh, nothing to add to it. Um, apart from the fact that um, I was partially responsible for it because I was involved in the European Convention, the Constitutional Treaty, the drafting of the Lisbon Treaty, etc. And already at that time we were um, saying um, this is going to work um, awkwardly because there were too many actors appearing um, in different fields and in particular on foreign policy. Second remark is that uh, there is an increasingly um, stronger appeal of foreign policy for politicians at the national level, at the European level too. Um, and foreign policy and is becoming more and more interlinked with domestic policies. So there was maybe a time where prime minister of a certain given country could not be active on foreign policy. Now this is almost impossible. And uh, because of this, and because also of the huge transformation that the international arena is living through, in the particular in the last years, I 
tell my, my colleagues that we are li living through a geopolitical pandemic. There is almost not a single corner in the world uh, where you look at and there is no a problem or a crisis. Um, two days ago, we got news that there was something like maybe a coup de time in Sierra Leone. Thanks to God, it was not the case. But the news were confusing at the beginning, so I reported to the high rep, and the answer from the high rep by WhatsApp was another one. So, a um, lot of things are happening in the, in the international arena. We are moving th towards a multipolar world uh, where the rules um, that we have been used to in the last 70 years are being put into question. And the European Union, which uh, is in the process of becoming a geopolitical entity, a global actor in particular, with the answer it has been given to the uh, war against Ukraine, uh, suddenly uh, finds itself in a different, difficult situation when a different conflict erupts, the one in the Middle East, and we realize immediately that the positions of the 27 member states, who at the end of the day are the, the lords, the monsieur, the seigneur, of the European Union foreign policy, are very different, very different among them. And then we see ourselves in a situation in which we could lose in a couple of months all the efforts of the last two years if we are not able to reconstruct among us a unity of action, a unity of message, a common narrative, and certain common position that we can present and defend. And we are suffering a lot out of this. Then there is the question of uh, persons and personalities. Um, I'm a diplomat, I work with people, and I work with words. And um, if you want to exchange with someone, if you want to negotiate, if you want to reach a compromise, you have to know that person, where she or he is coming from, nationality, political opinions, feelings, hobbies, etc. That's the only way you can try then to approach his, um, him, her, and try to build something together. So taking into account the institutional setup, quite complex. Taking into account the increasing appeal of um, foreign policy. And taking into account personalities, we have a situation that I, as current head of cabinet of the High Rep, together with others, we have to manage. It's a challenge, but, um, well, we are supposed to be trained for that. So, one of the things that, in my opinion, is important is to clarify the role of the High Representative for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy as also Vice President of the Commission, who is responsible for coordination of external action. This is very important, but someone sometimes is almost forgotten. In fact, when uh, the Lisbon Treaty came into force and we had the first high representative, Kathy Ashton, she was, because the treaty says so, vice president of the commission. And she was the only vice president of the commission at that time. Then we had Federica Mogherini. She was also vice president of the commission. Not the only one, but the first vice president of the commission. Now, in the current commission, we have a completely different situation. For political reasons, you remember very well the situation when uh, President von der Leyen was elected and, and Franz Timmerman was not, and then Franz Timmerman was designed as first executive vice president, that's new, executive vice president of the commission. And then you had to take into account the other political families 
And then you had a second executive vice president of the commission and a third executive vice president of the commission. And then comes the only vice president which appears in the treaty, which is Borrell. But if you look at it from a protocolar point of view, he's now, he was in the past, he was number two, now he's number five. He's number five. What is going to happen now that um, Commissioner Rupilainen is leaving the Commission temporarily because of her candidacy uh, to the presidential elections in Finland? Who is going to be the member of the college who is going to take the responsibilities for uh, her dossiers right now? We don't know yet, although I think I know who is not going to be the member of the college who will take that responsibility. So the first thing, the first thing, and it's very important really, is to clarify what's the role of the high representative, and I'm not thinking about the current one, but in the future, as vice president of the commission. He has to have strong role in that. I remember, and you will excuse me for being personal on this, I sense, personal anecdote almost. When I was involved into the drafting of the constitutional treaty and we were discussing the role of the high representative, I was the first collaborator of the Spanish member of the presidium of the convention. And I suggested that if the high representative was, only to be, was truly to be in charge of coordination of the external action of the European Union, then he had to be, have an extra weight. In what sense? I mean, in theory, looking at the rules of procedure of the Commission, the Commission can take, the College can take decisions by simple majority. This never happens, okay? But it can. It's in, it's, it's in the rules of procedure. So, what I said is, if a decision is going to be taken on external action, trade, humanitarian aid, financial aid to a third country, and for some reason, the high representative who happens to be the vice president of the Commission opposes it, then the decision can still be taken, but by a qualified majority, not only by a simple majority. That would have given him extra power. It was not accepted by this Kardestan. Okay. Um, another thing we are doing, we have to do, but we are already working on that, is improve the working relationship between the cabinets, and in particular between the heads of cabinets, of the three main actors the President of the European Council, the President of the European Commission, and the High Representative, Vice President of the Commission. I am working on, on this, but I am not the only one. We are working on this. It's a way of improving things, and it's pain. And the third thing is that we have to be careful not to allow third parties or external actors to the institutions to play this division against us to cherry pick and choose who is the one they want to speak with or who is the one they are going to invite as representative of the European Union because they are very clever and they are doing it against us and our interests. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Villarino, especially for uh, underlining the uh, ambivalences in the treaty and the, the lack of precision on certain aspects. What really struck me is that you, you pointed out to, of course, there are personalities, but there are really also flaws in the treaty from the very beginning, which you're aware of. I think that was very interesting. And I like your new buzz, buzzword, geopolitical pandemic. So, <laughs> that was quite, <laughs> quite striking. Anyway, let's, let's move on to our next speaker, Mr. Mr. Dynan. You've been meticulously observing and assessing the activity of all the EU institutions from over 30 years. Uh, today you will focus uh, on the role of the President of the European Commission in external representation. You have certainly a lot of to tell us and I'm really looking forward to your contribution. Thank you Astrid, it's a great pleasure to be here um, back at EPRS where I'm a resident fellow again and uh, thank you and your colleagues here for your hospitality. Um, as an academic, when I think about the European Union, which I do all the time, <clears throat> and when I study a particular institution or policy, I take one of two approaches. Uh, comparative politics approach or the approach of the European Union as an N of one, as a unique entity. And when taking a comparative politics approach, the comparators or the comparisons are with 
other states, not with other international organizations, because we know that the European Union is more state-like than being typical of an international organization. And the comparative approach is particularly useful when looking at certain institutions, such as the European Parliament, but less useful when looking at certain policies, such as foreign and security policy. Although I would say that the comparative approach is instructive in one respect, which is that cacophony and dissonance is not unique to the European Union when it comes to foreign policy. We're all mentioning Henry Kissinger. Somebody should have asked Henry Kissinger, who speaks for the United States in the early 1970s, and he would have said, I do. But in the early 1970s, he was the National Security Advisor. He was not the Secretary of State. He usurped the office of Secretary of State and then became Secretary of State. So my point is that even in a political system where the lines of command and the constitutional requirements or arrangements for foreign policy are quite clear, often that does not work out in practice for obvious reasons, bureaucratic rivalry, agency, competition, and, and, and personality factors. And I think if we look at the member states of the European Union today, we'll see exactly the same thing, even more so because coalition governments are increasingly prominent. And coalition the only reason, I'm not suggesting that coalition governments are the only reason for such dissonance, but it certainly contributes to it. So let's take the N of 1 approach. Let's look at the European Union as a distinctive, indeed unique actor, specifically with respect to foreign and security policy. Why is that the case? Well, Mr. Close has alluded to it, of course, which is the way in which the European Union developed. Foreign and security policy came late to the European community and to the European Union, which is not to say that from the very beginning, the European coal and steel community, let alone the European community, did not have a foreign policy. It did, of course. Um, Walter Hallstein visited the United States for the first time to represent the Coalition community in 1954. And as policies developed in the new European community in the 60s, uh, the common market had an external dimension to it, trade policy, competition policy had, and still has, a vibrant external dimension to it, the common agricultural policy, and so forth. But then, as foreign policy became part of, or came under the umbrella of the European community, it did so in a very distinctive way. And again, Mr. Close has alluded to it. The original EPC, European Political Cooperation. And European Political Cooperation was qu kept quite distinct from other activities in the European community. In fact, it was not until the single European Act that EPC was brought under the umbrella of the European community, but in a separate intergovernmental it wasn't called Pillar, Title III, separate intergovernmental arrangement. The Pillar system in the Maastricht Treaty had a separate pillar for foreign and security policy. We know that the Pillar system has gone, but we also know that under the Lisbon arrangement, there is still a separate regime for foreign and security policy, which is primarily intergovernmental. Now, I, I don't want to suggest that there is or indeed should be a rigid distinction between intergovernmentalism and supranationalism. That's a rather dated view, I think, of the European community. It's, it's helpful. Um, but I think the arrangements for foreign security policy can be described as being primarily um, intergovernmental. Now, ways to bridge the gap, if you like, include what we've been talking about already, the fact that the Commission President is so active in the European Council. The Commission President has been a member of the European Council from the beginning, but as the European Council has become more important, not least because of the various crises over the past 15 years or so, and as foreign and security policy has, has gone, gone up the agenda of the European Union and uh, within dis in discussions in the European Council, the Commission President, of course, has played an active part in that. And um, the um, High Representative sitting in the European Council, not as a member, but attending the European Council, uh, and having a foot in the Commission as a Vice President is important too. Although I would say, and I'll say this rather parenthetically, in my view, the Vice President leg, if you like, in the European Parliament, uh, European Commission, I beg your pardon, is the weakest. Um, in fact, I was looking at attendance records in the European Commission at the weekly um, Commission meetings, and, and I see that Mr. Borrell is conspicuous, not entirely by his absence, um, but he is, his attendance record is pretty poor. Now, it, he, tra he does travel a lot, I agree with you, and when I, when I first you know, when I followed the Constitutional Convention and, and the Constitutional Treaty and the Lisbon Treaty, I thought, how can one person fill this job? But nonetheless, it's revealing that he has to privilege his attendance somewhere 
And it is, of course, in the Foreign Affairs Council. It is, of course, in the European Council, but not so much in, in the Commission. But nonetheless, let, let's talk about the Commission President. The Commission President has a particular advantage, I think, when it comes to external representation, in that the Commission Presidency is the face of the European Union. If you ask people in the European Union uh, who represents the European Union institutionally, they'll say the Commission President. They might not know who the Commission President is, but they will say the Commission President. And another way in which I think the Commission President has an advantage is the annual State of the Union address. Because that's a showcase when the Commission President can lay out an agenda covering the entire uh, panoply of the of the European Union. Now, one might say that the State of the Union address isn't all that important, but it's nonetheless a, as I said, it's a showcase, it's an opportunity, and a very visible one, to lay out an agenda that includes foreign policy, obviously, and, and security policy, and not just the traditional activities of the European Commission. It's an opportunity which the European Council President does not have. Now, um, the speakers have already alluded to this, and as an academic um, with no institutional affiliation, I can be more blunt. The rivalry between the Commission President and the European Council President. There is an inherent institutional rivalry. This is not new that there is a rivalry, of course not. But looking only at the, at the standing European Council Presidents, the rivalry was managed in the past. I, I mean, by the first, uh, we, we've had three uh, standing European Council Presidents, and during that time, three Commission Presidents. And the first two European Council Presidents and Commission Presidents worked it out somehow. What's different now? Is it structural? Is it political? Is it personal? Politically, it might be that this Commission has identified itself as a geopolitical Commission. And that states very clearly its ambition uh, to be identified as such and to lay a claim to a more active involvement or role in foreign and security policy. But I think we all agree, and by we all, uh, I'm talking about the extensive reporting um, in reputable media about what is going on in the European Commission, what's going on in the European Council, and the poor relationships, uh, relationship between the, specifically, of course, between uh, President Michel and President von der Leyen. Now, Mr. Close said, Somebody should have put them in a room and not let them out until they sorted it out. That's not enough. <laughs> no, by, 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 by that I mean... <laughs> no, no, no. I, I understand. But what I'm getting at is this. Michel and von der Leyen are agents. Who are the principals? In the case of Michel, the principals are the members, the heads of state and government in, in the European Council. In the case of von der Leyen, the principals are the heads of state and government who nominate the Commission President and the European Parliament who elects the Commission President. Why did no, by nobody I mean, why did the heads of state and government re-elect Michel by acclaim without having a discussion with him? Maybe they did, I, I don't know. But without talking to him about this. Why is von der Leyen being spoken of as a, 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 having a second term by acclaim almost with nobody bringing this up? We talk a lot about accountability in the European Union. This is an example of poor accountability at the very, very top. And um, I, I think we all know why, of course, <laughs> there is no accountability. When the Commission President is, is nominated um, and, and, and then elected, and the European Council um, President is elected, these people are chosen because of the country that they come from meaning the region of Europe that they come from and, and, and to that extent represent, their party political affiliation, obviously, their gender. What about competence? What about experience? What about ability? Now, Michelle and von der Leyen are highly competent and, and um, experienced individuals, but especially given their records. Now, Michelle will not be commissioned council president the next time around, we know. But it's not enough, as I've heard some people, not on this panel, but in this town say, oh, the problem of rivalry will be gone because Michelle won't be around anymore. But von der Leyen may be around. And I'll finish with that. I think there should be accountability at the top, and there is not. Thank you, thank you Desmond, for your very, uh, well, the outstanding presentation, especially the frank words. 
uh, you pointed to a certain number of difficulties, accountability is one of them. Uh, that is actually why my new unit is being created, is that we point out also the lack of accountability at the very top. So thank you for, for, for underlining this. Um, now, with our first three speakers, we talked, let's say we looked at the internal aspects of the issue, who speaks for Europe. We looked at the institutional, at the high representative, at the European Council, at the European Commission. Uh, with our next speaker, we will be observing, um, let's say, the external action from the outside, from our, our, our neighboring countries. Uh, Tiona, um, you have the floor and you will focus on the perception by our neighbors of our external action. You have the uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon, and thank you so much for inviting me to this very interesting conference and the panel discussion. It's rather difficult for me now to comment and to have a meaningful points after this stellar panel intervention, but I will try to uh, uh, offer some, uh, some reflections regarding this pertinent question, who speaks for Europe? And I think that the answer to that largely depends on the assumptions that we are making about the member states' uh, foreign policy preferences, but also their national political preferences is because this, uh, the way how national politics affect the foreign policy preferences are, are often uh, uh, over underestimated uh, when discussing the, the, the question who speaks for Europe. And obviously these preferences are influenced, especially now uh, with the new geopolitical context which affects on the European Union's responses. And we know that due to this very distinct nature, political nature of the European Union, the responses coming from the EU can be inspired by intergovernmental logic or by the community method logic or by also combination of, of both. So uh, this new geopolitical context that we are facing now and also the increased competition, right, uh, uh, has definitely, and it's an obvious, that uh, it has affected the EU's enlargement policy. For instance, uh, two years ago, it would have been unthinkable to, that uh, European Union would grant the candidate status to Ukraine and Moldova and to offer the membership prospects to Georgia. You know that this was uh, absolutely not envisaged by the Europe, uh, Eastern Partnership policy uh, two years ago, but now things are different, we have new narratives, we have new momentum on new enlargement agenda, and these new shifts also has indeed influenced the way how the Eastern Partnership countries, but also the Western Balkans, uh, I say Eastern Partnership, but now of course we are speaking about the associated trio, because these three countries, Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia, are trying to advance more, and we will see now in the Council's the, the, the decision on the 14th and 15th of December. But uh, how this affected on the perception of the uh, enlargement countries? Well, I would say that uh, EU's external representation, the pattern and the structure of these narratives, they have become much more relevant, much more significant. So they are really much, very much appealing also to the national leaders and, uh, uh, and to the EU hopefuls. And uh, this uh, question, who speaks for Europe, is also so much pertinent for uh, for the enlargement countries and why because they also would like to take part in co-framing and in uh, creation co-creation of that messages and perhaps that's also the why we hear some uh, ideas about the gradual integration when it comes to also cfsp alignment and uh, the possibilities of inviting for instance the foreign affairs ministers at the council configuration and so on and so forth this indicates that the enlargement countries they don't only no longer want to be in this waiting room, but they feel that they would like to contribute uh, better and more, let's say, uh, deeper when it comes to the, the, the debates and discussions about the future of Europe and its foreign policy. And the second point, I would say that this new uh, geopolitical momentum and enlargement momentum has affected on the scale of the expectations of enlargement countries. And I think that, and I would argue, of course, we can discuss about this, but I would argue that um, the, the logic of relationship has shifted from a logic of appropriateness to logic of consequences. And here I mean that the enlargement countries, they have become more demanding, more maximalist also in their, when it comes to their ambitions uh, and the EU integration path. And uh, this is important to observe, this change of logic. Of course, the appropriateness logic is there because we know that the enlargement will remain uh, the merit-based uh, uh, on, the, on the basis of 
the merits. However, of course, the degrees, how these two logics, they interact, I would say that it's more towards uh, consequential logic. So benefits are more clear. And this, what are these benefits? This benefit is membership in the EU. So this has sharpened the enlargement countries. They know that they can go ahead and to a certain extent also be maximalist. And um, uh, yes, uh, this uh, uh, argument also uh, inspires perhaps us to, to reflect that, uh, uh, but that they indeed, what I mentioned, that they would like to uh, have a, a bigger place and, and a better place at the table uh, when the CFSP is also being decided. But a few more points about the perception itself um, uh, that we can uh, perhaps uh, Unfortunately, I have to say that in academia, in the research, we don't have much uh, material and uh, literature to really understand what are these perceptions, but also stemming from the practical observations and engagement with the political leaders and uh, also other actors. I would offer a reflection that uh, many of you would not find that uh, surprising news. And this reflection is that uh, uh, by the enlargement countries, uh, the EU's external representation is understood as, as a as a dissonance, as a disaccord, as perhaps I will not uh, use this cacophony, but uh, we heard this, of course, and I think we should not shy away to discuss also uh, that this is happening. And uh, the second is uh, about uh, the um, labyrinth of the doors, how these policies are being framed. Mr. McAllister, he left now, but he mentioned the delegations. Of course, delegations are very much operational, but the challenge is that the staff is changing very often, so they are rotating, and national actors also, for them, it's difficult to establish uh, working relations and make sure that through the delegations and their engagement they can affect and impact and have a, a meaningful, let's say, uh, operational uh, outcome in this respect. Um, and uh, uh, therefore, uh, also in one point, uh, uh, which is, I believe, important, is also to understand that these enlargement countries, uh, also they are not used to, uh, let's say, smooth network governance. So for them, uh, foreign policy is uh, like one country, one government, one minister. So therefore, this kind of dissonance that is coming from the European Union is uh, also understood as a, as a confusion as such, and I'm happy to engage in the discussion. And I think that the biggest challenge also what we have now is indeed, of course, uh, on a wider scale to manage the enlargement process that is also managing the expectations, but also the biggest challenge in this res related to the EU's external uh, representation is to make sure this, uh, this institutional rivalry and this competition, and here I also mentioned the date, the now announcement of 2030, that uh, by many of the actors this was interpreted as um, uh, not a horizon, not a framework, but as a deadline by the European Union. So we should make sure, I believe, that this uh, institutional competition does not spill over on, uh, on, the, on the enlargement countries um, national politics because it will affect the European Union's credibility and uh, it will affect, of course, uh, but, but yes, the confidence also, the trust also uh, when it comes to the management of the expectations, when it comes to the user enlargement. And perhaps uh, it will also create that, that academics also refer to rhetorical uh, entrapment and it will at some point backfire if we don't uh, try to manage the expectations and channel this management uh, through the proper and unified representation, not with the unison messages, but as one of our speakers mentioned. So the key lines should be the same. We cannot have the situation when the Parliament and the Commission and the European Council, they have different messages on the enlargement because this, this will not uh, work in the, in the long term and even in the medium term. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Lavrilashvili, for your for your intervention. It was it was very interesting to see that there is some work to be done to uh, reduce, let's say, the confusion on the side of uh, of the partners and to sort of channel the words, uh, the words, the message. Uh, so there's work on our side, and there's work on maybe on on the on the ground to have longer 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 representations, people staying, having a better working relationship. And you've also called on, uh, on academia to work on, uh, <laughs> on working on the perceptions by the member states as to 
something to be done in the next years. Uh, thank you. We'll move to our, to our last speaker, Susanna, who is actually the author of the publication, The European Council President and the EU's External Representation, which uh, Wolfgang Hiller mentioned earlier. You can find the publication on the library stands or on the EP Think Tank. Uh, Susanna, you will... Uh... Oh, yeah. Thanks. Sorry. Well, you have the floor. <laughs> thank you very much, Astrid. Um, and good afternoon to the audience here in the room and online. Uh, I think a lot of ground has been already covered by the panel. So I will kind of uh, make my remarks shorter so that we have time for Q&A. But there are a couple of aspects that I would like to pick up on. And I would start from this question that is our question today. So who speaks for Europe? By now, I think it's clear to everyone that we have a plurality of actors. And that plurality of actors is prone to competition. And not necessarily to cooperation. And that there is a lot of work to be done in order to create what I would call a cooperation reflex. So we don't have this cooperation reflex for now. So my first two points would be about competition, cooperation. And I think that there is another element on which we would need to uh, focus because who speaks for Europe is interesting and it's one part of the equation, but the other part is the message, the message that the EU is projecting outside. So my third point would be about communication. And if we look at, at foreign policy, um, we kind of see that um, there is this defense of interests abroad. And this defense of interests abroad, when defending interests abroad, be it at the EU level or at the national level, is kind of a combination, a very, very uh, delicate combination of performance, lack of cacophony, harmony, Jim said, of the different actors, of the different actions and strategies that either the EU or the member states are putting into place, but also of the messages. So um, on competition, a couple of reflections. Thank you, Jim, for outlining the, the treaty. Uh, that saved me uh, going into, into the legal aspects. But on the other hand, the Lisbon Treaty provisions um, are generic enough. I think we can agree that they are generic enough to allow for parallel action and for competition. And one of the different actors uh, becomes more assertive. Um, he or she can reshape the role that is playing at a particular moment. And if we look at the different successive European Council presidents, we have seen some which have been less interested in reshaping their, their, their um, roles, but we have also seen the current European Council president who has been a little bit more active and proactive in reshaping his, his role and go beyond what is in the treaty, the CFSP stricto sensu. So uh, this reshaping of, 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 of the role comes to the expense and with the competition for the other actors in the equation, the European Commission President, the High Representative, and uh, allows, and here I join you, Jim, in what you have said, allows to a certain extent the European Council President to span across all uh, policies with an external dimension and go beyond CFSP strict society, which could be an interesting development which will, remains to be seen if the next European Council president will continue or will pick up on. But on the other hand, the treaty also says that the European Council president has to represent the EU at his level. And then in this, in this attempt to go beyond, the European Council president may sometimes also uh, engage with other audiences. And a case in point, is the speech that we have seen at the UN Security Council. The UN Security Council is to be addressed and the treaty is saying um, by the high representative. And those sitting in the UN Security Council are ambassadorial level 
um, persons. So this going out of uh, and reshaping the portfolio has been has been has been one of the key, I think, takeaways of the mandate of uh, of uh, Charles Michel. There is another element which I would like to to, to pinpoint at uh, high level ne mediations. Um, we have seen that um, the, the European Council president has been rather active in the Armenia-Azerbaijan uh, negotiations. And that's kind of a renewal with some practices which existed before uh, the entry into force of the Lisbon Treaty, because we can all remember 2008 and Georgia and the role President Sarkozy has played in, in, uh, at the time in mediating uh, the, Georgia, uh, the, war, uh, the conflict in Georgia. But I think, and there I'm joining uh, Desmond in, in his plea for accountability. I think at the time there was kind of an, an accountability in the sense that mediation has been done in an emergency, but then there was an extraordinary European Council which has followed and which has given a mandate, a clear mandate, for the continuation of the mediation for the president of the rotating council presidency, Hans, at the time, Nicolas Sarkozy, the high representative of the time, and the president of the commission. Whilst in the mediation currently uh, of Armenia, Azerbaijan, there was not such an endorsement from the European Council as the European Council, and the mediation was taking place in a parallel framework, that one of the European political community, so within the margins of the European political community. And there is something that we could discuss there in terms of, in terms of accountability. The second point rapidly on, on cooperation. I said this, there is, it's important to have this cooperation reflex. I don't know if just by placing them in one room that would solve the problem or that uh, you would apply a principle of a conclave uh, no one lives from there. Uh, but what we have seen by looking at uh, the action uh, and uh, external representation of the first year of war, um, so uh, we have seen that communication between the high representative, the U European Commission president, and the uh, president of the European Council is rather scattered. Uh, a comparison of their agendas says that they meet Rarely, they do not meet at three, most likely at two, but this is very rare. And yes, they attend summits together, but they do not do side meetings accompanying summits, UN high level week or G7 uh, summits or G20 summits. They do not do these meetings together. They rather tend to have them individually. And this brings me to uh, communication. So because I was kind of rather um, not very positive in what I have said until now, so I would like to bring a note of uh, more positive aspect. Uh, if you look at the messages that the uh, European Council President, uh, European Commission President and the High Representative uh, were conveying to third countries or to, to the international audience, those messages in terms of topics covered are exactly the same. So we have a top 10 of the same topics, starting with Ukraine as the first uh, and, and, and main topic in their speeches or press conferences, running uh, down to different uh, policies, uh, including economic policy and energy, which are more, more likely covered by the European Commission uh, president. But there is not necessarily coherence in how this message is is conveyed. And this is where the cacophony comes in, comes in again, because um, basically there is also a pressure of the effet d'annonce. And this effet d'annonce, if we look just back a couple of weeks ago uh, on uh, the enlargement and the enlargement 2030, there could have been more coordination and cooperation before such an announcement would have been put forward uh, to, to, to the external audience. And I stop here, Astrid. Thank you, do you feel that I wanted to stop you? Well, we, luckily we have another 20 minutes. Thank you for your, for your contribution and for elaborating on your findings. We've got, well, bit, almost 20 minutes for questions. So maybe I will start with questions in the room and Ralph, if there are questions from the uh, audience online. I've got a question here, the lady in, in green. 
please state your name and where, where you work. That would be, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, first, uh, thank you very much for organizing this conference and uh, also to the speaker for all these interesting topics. Um, my name is Ada Gabriela. I'm working at the Subcommittee on Security and Defense at the European Parliament. I'm a Schumann trainee. So I had some questions uh, for the speakers because, um, well, maybe first of all, what I found really interesting is how we need right to to evolve uh, at the European Union and also actually there was a statement yesterday from Mario Draghi who actually said that Europe is at a critical moment right now and what it needs to solve all the crises that we're facing right now is to become a state so I think this is a very interesting point raised up by Mario Draghi who was uh, of course a very important uh, um, person uh, in the EU. And also two more points, uh, maybe f uh, one for Mr. Dinan, because you mentioned... Your, your question, because you said... Yeah, yeah, I'll be quick. So you mentioned the rivalry uh, between the European Council and the European Commission. There have been some proposals about having this uh, uh, commission, commissioner of defence. So maybe do you think that having a commissioner of defence specifically will solve this problem? And just, um, um, yeah, it's fine. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Maybe I'll take a second question so the, the speakers can answer both. I've got... Elina? Thank you very much, uh, Elena Lazaro from the European Parliamentary Research Service. It's really great to listen to all of you. Um, I can't help listening to you and thinking that today the High Representative is speaking at the EDA conference with his other identity as head of the European Defence Agency, so many hats there. I had a question to Jim Close. Sorry? <laughs> There's the EUISS as well. Um, anyway, a question to Jim Close. I, I found very interesting that you mentioned uh, the need for, well, you made a call for the EU to have representation of its own in a number of multilateral organizations where it doesn't. And actually at EPRS, we've mapped the uh, subsequent calls of the European Parliament for that in a number of multilateral organizations. But my question is how feasible is that uh, as long as uh, the decision-making process in foreign policy is the one that it is? And would you think that some multilateral organizations offer themselves more for this kind of move, notwithstanding that in some the EU is always represented? So thank you for that. And really thanks to all the speakers. It's been great. Thank you. Do we have another question so we can all wrap them up? Um, please. Thank you. Uh, um, my name is Birk. I'm a journalist from Denmark and currently a trainee in the press unit. Uh, one a simple question. I'm curious how we as journalists should uh, frame the European Union in the future, especially regarding foreign policy. It's not uh, an easy question when most citizens don't really understand how it works and don't know all of the faces of the EU. Thank you. Okay, so uh, maybe since you asked questions, Jim Close, you want to, to start? I'll make a few quick points. Uh, the first one, uh, Susanna, just uh, I, I think we, we must make one distinction. I mean, it is true that the external role officially in the treaty of the uh, PAC is CFSP. But of course, don't forget the PAC chairs the body which gives political direction on every single issue. So if there are European Council conclusions, he's perfectly uh, entitled to present them abroad. So that's my first point. Uh, the second point is, um, uh, is uh, comes, goes back to what Desmond said. I do agree that uh, I personally, I couldn't say it when I was a civil servant, but I can say, well, I'm still uh, retired, but I can still say it. I do think that in those issues, I think, for instance, the trip to Israel should not have taken place in the absence of some statement by the European Council, which came too late. And so I do agree with you with the role of the European Council to setting the standards. And then it doesn't matter so much who goes in a way, you see. But of course, uh, the other thing which we must say too is the Commission represents the EU in all areas, except explicitly CFSP. And CFSP, that was the issue here. So, I mean, uh, uh, people on all sides have to respect the... Uh, the mandate. Uh, that was my thing. 
uh, I forgot to mention, even the rotating presidency tries to play a role in external relations. They don't have one according to the treaty. But again, I would not overdo this because obviously the Belgian, uh, the, the, the Spanish presidency chairs Coripair and the General Affairs Council who prepare the European Council so that the Spanish Prime Minister and the Belgian Prime Minister go to Rafa, I think is fine. It's not, it's, it's not a problem provided, of course, uh, 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 the, the, the position of the EU is respect, respected. On uh, Mr. Draghi, just one word. I, I admire him greatly, but I disagree. I don't think we should become a state. I don't think it's feasible, in, certainly not in the short term. And in the short term, if you push it, I think it would disrupt the union. But that's a very personal view. And on the question which you asked, feasibility, extremely difficult, of course. But this is one of the areas where we have to think more long term and there will be situations. I think if the world develops the way it now develops, lots of things will change. Even maybe what I said about one state. So, uh, I mean, you should never say never. But certainly in terms of external representation, the UN Security Council thing. If we really get into a situation that no one listens anymore to the EU, we are losing ground everywhere. Miracles happen. Look what we've done without treaty change or anything uh, over the last 15 years. In every single crisis, we have integrated more. Last point, that is not a question which, you know, people say qualified majority voting. I think it's a bit simplistic. Uh, uh, I have some doubts on qualified majority voting in, in CFSP for, for reasons I can explain, but not now. But a decision, for instance, to have one seat in the European, uh, in the UN Security Council will never be opposed by qualified majority. Just imagine outvoting France on this. Just forget about it. So this will, it's not a question of qualified majority. It's a question of a political will around the table to do it. Thank you. I was a bit too long. Ms. Villarino, do you want to? Well, maybe a quick uh, answer to the question of a possible uh, defense commission. Well, in fact, we already have one. Uh, Commissioner Breton is our defense commissioner. He takes care of the industry of defense, and he does it very well, and there is a perfect and very good and friendship and friendly relationship between uh, him and the high representative uh, who is responsible for security policy. If uh, in the future there is a proposal to go beyond uh, the current competencies of the Commission, that's perfectly fine, but it will require a change in the, in the treaties. Uh, Mr. Dyant, do you want to? Uh... Yeah, um, let me pick up on the question um, from the journalist. I find that very, a very interesting question because I'm, I'm very interested, of course, in how to communicate the European Union. And this may seem paradoxical in view of what we were saying, and I was saying in particular about the personal rivalries. Personalities are important in politics. People connect to personalities. I think if at, at the national and subnational and regional level, locally throughout Europe, if people can get excited about politics in Brussels and personalities are interesting, that can only help. So I think there, there, there are two things to focus on. One is relevance. Why, why does it matter what happens in Brussels? But the other is how things happen in, in Brussels. But the, the paradox here, if you like, is by focusing on the personalities, you're then emphasizing the dysfunction <laughs> in, in, in Brussels in, in this particular case. Thank you. Yes, a uh, few reflections, but before I would like to also to, um, uh, to comment on the qualified majority voting that uh, Mr. Claus also was uh, mentioning that it is a bit too simplistic, and I tend to agree, and I have to say, as perhaps you also have seen yesterday, we had an event with uh, um, uh, Jaume, head of communication of parliament, with Mogherini, uh, and, uh, and she said, I asked her this question, so what do you think about, will, will it work, and what do you think, it, is it something that will, will really help this decision-making process, and, and she said no. And she, she also, perhaps it's telling, it's telling that we don't have yet this culture, culture, transition of culture of consensus to this transition of this tragic culture. And okay, we can 
see whether Diplomatic Academy, which is also, by the way, uh, a big effort of uh, Magherini, uh, that, that the College of Europe, uh, it's, uh, it's happening, this initiative. Uh, it's excellent, yes. Uh, we will see how this will also um, help uh, creation of that culture. Uh, however, uh, my point is also um, uh, related to the uh, skills that enlargement countries also need in order to make sure that uh, integration process can work. For instance, we know that uh, twin transition, the Green Deal, is, is uh, we need uh, uh, these countries to align to these initiatives. But if you try to find somebody in Georgia, in Moldova, in Ukraine, like to, who is a specialist on the issues, you cannot find. So we need to invest in these uh, uh, skills and make sure that uh, the countries and their actors and the, uh, uh, we have the capacity, institutional and human capacity to uh, integrate this a key. It's really a huge job. It's not uh, uh, 50 or 60 percent, it's 100 percent that needs to be integrated. So, And this also relates slightly to the question about the communication. How do we communicate? And this is a very important question because again in uh, speaking from the experience that I'm observing in Georgia as well that uh, there are many miscommunication when it comes to the European Union it's related to the uh, mismanagement of the expectations on the one hand but also because of this very simple fact that we don't know how does the EU work even though for instance in Georgia or in other countries we have uh, a high enthusiasm of EU integration people think that the next day when the countries become member of the EU, it, next day they will become just rich. So this is their understanding. That is why it is important to uh, make sure that we communicate, sorry, we communicate about the impact, what will be the impact of integration and what will be also the painful moments of the, of the, of the reform process. I will stop here. Thank you, Tirana. Um, I think we've got another six minutes, so maybe we can take a question from, uh, from the audience online. Uh, Alf? Thanks, Astrid. There's a very, very active debate uh, going on online in the digital floor. So I just pick up maybe two of them. One of them is about how much impact is there of those divisions that is at the world stage, such as Israel, Palestine and conflict on the EU's meaningful role. If we don't uh, agree, how much can we be of an impact uh, uh, as a global player? Uh, the second one would be following the communications discussion is do we need a set of rules of procedures for external representation of the EU with clarified responsibilities, principles and procedures for external communication involving our uh, leaders? And a last one which kind of sums up is to all speakers, if you had to pick one actionable proposal requiring treaty change or not towards a stronger, more coherent EU's external action foreign policy, which one would that be? I'll give the floor to Susanna, who hasn't uh, answered any questions. Sorry. Yeah, yeah thank you, Astrid. Um, quickly, on, um, I will pick on uh, the rules of procedure. Uh, I think that, um, and that links also to, to, to QMV uh, to a certain extent, um, I think that we have to be aware that there is a limit in what we can do uh, with uh, instruments which have also a less or, or non-binding or binding, depending, um, footprint. Because this is not necessarily something that is going to allow us to, to advance. Rules of procedure can be good, but we have also personalities there too. So there is a modus vivendi that has to be, and this cooperation reflects that I was, I was mentioning earlier. I think it has to be uh, based possibly on some rules of procedure that we should not put all emphasis on rules of procedure because that would uh, make us lose from flexibility and flexibility in foreign policy is something which is important. That would be my first first uh, thing. Um, and then um, on uh, the treaty change. Um, I think that uh, treaty change for first it's could be a very risky road for the EU. That's my, my, my own assessment. I do not think that we are at this moment necessarily prepared for that. Yes, there is a push for, for treaty change. Uh, but if there is a talk about treaty change, I think that we ought to consider that aspect of accountability that Desmond was mentioning. There is no um, link between the European Council President and the High Representative. They are completely operating in parallel dimensions. 
So uh, bringing to a certain extent the high representative and linking him to the European Council president, that would create an accountability link between the PAC and the high representative. Thank you. Yeah, Jim. Yeah, thanks. On this, I think my neighbor should answer because I don't actually agree with what you say there. Uh, uh, let me just uh, make two or three very quick remarks. Um, I think the answer to this problem is not a procedural one. Because you know what would happen there? The bureaucrats in the various institutes would run rampage, and you would spend ridiculous time about commas and things like that. It's, for me, it's a matter of common sense and a spirit of cooperation and political responsibility. So it's not uh, that. Uh, you asked for a concrete uh, proposal. Um, I, I, you know, I give you one simple example. I say it because I tried several times with all the presidents of the European Council to do something extremely simple. And it was the following, to have a joint kind of calendar of high-level contacts with the Chinese, let's say. You know, high-level means state at the head of state or government level, EU and national. And set that up, and then each time at the European Council, the European president would say, I see uh, Angela, well, at the time it was Angela, you've just come to China, can you tell us a bit about it said? And I see that the French president is going in two weeks. Can we have a little exchange on that? And can you make sure that there are two EU points, which, if you could make the following points. It's, it's, it looks bureaucratic, it would change a lot of things. Because what happens when they go to China? Well, when they go to China, uh, sometimes they remember that there is an EU, but not always. Uh, I have no problem that the German Chancellor tries to sell German cars and uh, the French, uh, you know, I have no problem with that. It's part of it. But each time they go, they should have in their luggage a one-pager on the two or three points which are important from the EU point. If you do that, the Chinese will look at things in a completely different way. Completely. Now they say those people, they are part of the Union, but they don't talk about it and vice versa. Last point, uh, if you want some arguments about this qualified majority voting, I have written a personal comment, on, it's on the TAPSA website, on the Franco-German report, where I explain why I have doubts about that. Thank you. The only thing I, I want is to clarify that the PEC and the High Representative speak uh, frequently, very frequently. They exchange messages on WhatsApp um, regularly and uh, we meet and when i say we because we meet also with the heads of cabinets and and uh, and the, the, the secretary general of the european external action service and the diplomatic advisor to the pec the six of us we meet regularly to coordinate so it's it's, it's working fine time is almost uh well we've come to the time we need to finish i just want to maybe Tiona, if you want to just something you want to very add. final uh, comment that goes along to what uh, uh, you were saying about the coordination. I think perhaps we should explore creating the coordinating group uh, among the institutions about the, especially the enlargement and the foreign policy messages. And here the role of the European Parliament in diplomacy will be important. Uh, Magalister also mentioned that uh, diplomacy should be strengthened, but I would say that yes, it, yes, it should be strengthened, but you cannot do it if you don't have a significant and good number of MEPs working on dossier look at Georgia, you have three, four, five maximum, even less, working on this, and then the, there are impressions and concerns coming from uh, the civil society and also think tanks that uh, this uh, is uh, not, uh, that there is not space also for other uh, engagement. So the point here is that if we want to uh, increase the effectiveness of the parliamentary diplomacy, we also need to find the ways to make sure that we have more wider cross-party uh, representation and interest and profiling when it comes to helping and understanding understanding the enlargement countries. Okay, thank you. I want to thank the speakers for their contribution. I mean, this was very fascinating. We learned a lot. We haven't answered the question, who speaks for Europe totally, but I'm, I'm sure we've moved forward. There were some concrete proposals, so that was already something. Um, I wish you all a very nice day. Thank you all for, for participating in the room and online. Good day. Bye-bye.